Hey guys, welcome to a special uh, episode of the JW Weatherman Show. Um, this is a live Q&A that we're doing with um, students of Cypherpunk University. So I initially did a class that was like eight hours. We all showed up and we just ground through economics, you know, start to finish for, for a really long day. And uh, the new format is basically all the lectures are recorded and then um, we hang out a lot in the forum and chat, and then we have some one-on-ones, but we also do this live Q&A thing as well. Um, about every two weeks is the plan. So that's what this is. And uh, we've got a couple alumni that uh, showed up, some people that listened to the lectures. Um, there, just to give you guys context also, part of the motivation for this was that uh, it gets really boring answering like kind of one-on-one questions all the time. So it's a lot more fun for me and a lot more fun for the other people that have sort of the one-on-one stuff nailed um, to uh, to be able to discuss stuff, knowing everybody else has sort of a, I don't know, at least a one-on-one sort of baseline. So anyway, uh, with that introduction, uh, we've got Dan, John, thanks, thanks for taking the class, guys, and thanks for showing up. And uh, uh, Nate as well. Uh, Nate's going to read some questions from the forum for folks that... Uh, had questions, but they weren't able to uh, to make it uh, at this time. So, um, yeah, Dan, uh, why don't you go first, man? How's it going? Thanks for showing up. And uh, what question do you have? Uh, yeah, it's been. Uh, I just want to say it's been a pleasure interacting with the the forum and the and the website so far. Um, I, I have a a good amount of questions listed here, so I guess I'm just going to start hitting you. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, looks like we lost John. Hopefully, he'll come back. But um, what we'll do is, what I want to do is do about forty-five minutes live with everybody else that can listen in, and then after that, we'll shut it down and we'll all just hang out and be more relaxed, um, knowing that if we say something stupid, it's only us, not hundreds of other people. Um, so yeah, you get. It looks like you you got uh, you got the you got plenty of time to ask whatever question you want. Awesome. Um, so, what are your thoughts on? Uh stable coins i don't know if you've touched on that at all but does any of the recent news in terms of it doesn't even look like gemini is able to really consistently uh keep that dollar price peg not to mention even you know the tether and bitfinex thing so is that is that something that you worry about uh regularly at all uh I, it's not something that I worry about. So there's a, there's a few good questions in there. Some are economic, so I'll try to stick with those first because um, those are real black and white. Um, so as far as a stable coin goes, you, it's not possible to create another asset and then force all of humanity to value it the same as the original asset. And uh, that's what would be required to have a coin that was like really pegged to the US dollar. Um, we we have a long history of people trying to do that and uh and it doesn't even make sense that it would be possible because it's just different right it's it's a different thing it might allow you to get access to something but it's not the something um so it's going to be valued differently it might be valued more right like tether uh if everybody trusted it as much as they trust a, a us dollar it could be worth 105 percent or 100.5 percent of uh, US dollars because it has better utility, right? It's digital, you can move it around, it's irreversible, whatever, you know, in theory. Um, but the reality is people don't trust it as much. And so I think last I heard it was, it was still trading pretty close to a dollar, like 97%, which is not, uh, that's not far off in context of history when we've tried to peg things to gold or silver or whatever there's always been some fluctuation so a couple percent is like nothing really um so as far as the concept of a stable coin it's just it, it doesn't make sense the, the the one advantage that it has over government fiat because government fiat is already digital um is that it's a better uh sort of payment network right it's like in theory irreversible transactions in theory relatively fast. If I wanted to accept money from your bank account, I wouldn't spend that money for a really long time because it can be reversed up to like six months if it's a US consumer checking account. Um, so it's pretty crap. Like the the payment systems that we have are terrible. So it, it can be pretty useful in that regard. Um, I do think at some point we'll see like a government coin possibly, uh, like a US uh, basically a cryptocurrency that 
is issued, and cryptocurrency is the wrong term, but I, I could imagine the US um, changing its payment network policies so that, uh, so that they're irreversible and the owner is based on a private key, something like that. Like it's, we get a little bit more honest about authentication. So I could see something like that happening, but that's only going to accelerate Bitcoin adoption because the hardest thing about Bitcoin adoption is buying Bitcoin. It's a total nightmare to buy Bitcoin in any kind of safe way right now. And that's not because it's Bitcoin, it's because of the old fiat system. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, if Tether ends up being uh, fractional, that it won't have an impact on the Bitcoin price. It's possible. Uh, I could. I could see that. I could see it going either way. I really don't. I really don't know how that would play out. Um, so yeah, I mean, on the economic side, it's impossible to do a stable coin. Um, on the entrepreneurial instinct side, these things are all going to go down. Um, we every time we have a bank or an opportunity to steal from people at scale, it always ends up happening. Um, so if Tether isn't crooked and they aren't taking some of the money out of the account, I'd be surprised. It'd be weird. It's possible, but it'd be pretty weird. And I would still say it's just a matter of time before something happens like that. Um, so I think that, uh, I think it's, you know, major security issues there. But I think a lot of the people that are dealing with it know that, right? If you have money in a U.S. bank account and you can't buy Bitcoin with it, but you can somehow get your hands on Tether and then buy Bitcoin with it, you know, I think I think people kind of know that there's a risk there. They probably underestimate it, but but it's hard to say. Um, it's it's always easy to say people are doing poor calculations on risk uh, without really knowing what their alternatives are. So um, I don't know. Does that does that answer your question, or uh, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, I, I kind of have similar feelings. I I can't. I don't get upset or worried about when when the fud comes out about the the stable coins it's just not a real interesting thing to me and i i also think and hope it it doesn't really pose any systemic or existential risks to the bitcoin ecosystem as a whole yeah yep cool cool yeah good question though man um let's see who jumped in next i'm going to try to do sort of a round robin thing was it uh nick or joe do you guys know or actually, Rollo. Sorry, could be any of you guys. Uh, it was Nick. Awesome, Nick. How's it going, man? Going good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I love your uh, your avatar. That's very disturbing. You're, you're giving me a run for my money. Oh well, appreciate that. So, um, <laughs> well, I've actually had a hard time coming up with questions. Uh, you know, after taking your class, I feel like so kind of assured of things that um, it's hard to think of uh, what else to what else to ask, what what else to worry about. And uh, so one thing that I've noticed, though, lately is, um, you know, especially after completing your class, I, I kind of have Bitcoin burnout, I guess you could call it. It's, uh, you know, I've, I've been reading less Bitcoin news, been in, spending less time on crypto Twitter. Uh, you know, once you understand that, that um, you know, Bitcoin maximalist argument is the only one that makes sense. And once you understand that, that Bitcoin has a very high likelihood of becoming adopted as money, it's like, there's not much else to talk about. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd like to continue to stay on top of things and, and also find ways to contribute to Bitcoin and, and, and you know, the cause. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how to do that and not sure how to keep my interest up either. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that's great, man. I mean, I'm really glad that the the chaos is, uh, has been beaten back a little bit by understanding what's really going on. Because, And it makes sense that it would, because almost everything is hype and lies. So once, once you have more context and once you have more grasp of what's actually happening as far as the space goes and uh, the incentive structure and all that, it makes sense that a lot of stuff would be Come pretty uninteresting so that, i think that's that's really good as far as keeping your interest up i don't know man i mean go uh go play with your wife and kids like just grab some bitcoin if you think it's a wise investment and then go work on other problems um if uh if you're a software developer and you have some ideas or some way to uh to build a product i'd say build it whether it has anything to do with bitcoin or not um because that's how we're going to that's how we're going to continue to keep each other alive, right? It's just solving solving more and more problems that uh, that we're all, you know, likely to face. So, um, 
yeah, I, I think it's great uh, that that the uh, that the drama isn't having. You're, you're not like it. It reminds me of that saying, like you know, um, just being thrown around on you know whatever hot news is out there because you don't have any root in you. Um, I think now you have a, a good you have a good set of roots, and when the wind blows, you're like, eh, whatever. I wasn't expecting any short term price action anyway. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's awesome actually. Um, cool. Yeah. Th thanks for the, thanks for the feedback too, man. That's really encouraging. Um, okay. I think did Nate, did you say Rolo or Joe was next? Uh, Rolo. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for joining, man. Had, had fun the other day on our, uh, our discussion too. Yeah. Yeah. So did I I've talked to some people about it and they, they really enjoyed it. So it was good stuff and, uh, related to that and it's your fault. I don't have any I don't have a Bitcoin question right now. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like something more related to that. Uh, I don't oh, know if okay. you want to push that to the end or go for it now. Yeah, actually, let's push that to the end just because once we start talking philosophy or religion or politics, we won't. Uh, we probably won't circle back to economics, uh, at least not quickly. Um, and actually, you know, depending on the timing, we might just have that conversation after we wrapped up wrap up the sort of uh, class Q&A. So, sure. yeah, uh, but yeah. Know. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for being here though, man. And I'm, I'm really now, now I'm going to, it's going to be a struggle not to wonder what your question is as I try to, <laughs> to deal with class stuff. So awesome. Joe, what's up, man? What, what, uh, what question do you have? Hey, what's up guys? Uh, good to be here. Um, I was watching your, uh, YouTube video last week and you did one, I guess on like lightning and other uses of that, like, I think it was accounting that you use it for something like that. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really piqued my interest because, you know, I'm a software developer and I'm looking for, you know, use case of Bitcoin. And yeah, I thought that was a really good one to just integrate with like a use case of money, but still like a unit of account. Like that's a use of, you know, it's a definition of, of money. So um, and coming from, I guess, you know, I was working with the Ethereum web wallet. So I was looking at a bunch of smart contracts this year. And yeah, like the only ones I feel that are like, you know, even like worthwhile or ones that even deal with money. So, yeah. you know, I, I write in the Bitcoin uh, standard that, you know, it, 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 there's no point if it's not money. So, yeah. I, yeah, I'm trying to think of, I guess, other like, I guess, use cases for how to integrate Bitcoin with accounting with, I guess, things that aren't in the same domain. Um, yeah. That's why it gets, I guess, what you say, like wet code or a little like, integrations with other things is where it gets pretty difficult yeah yeah totally yeah the the uh the talk that you're referencing just for other people um is i uh i have a 14 year old son and i pay him an allowance and then i charge him for stuff like leaving the front door open when the air conditioning's on or whatever and then he also uh basically pays rent to start feeling the weight of that and uh be ready to to be a man when the time comes instead of uh instead of be 30 years old and still you know sucking off of my teat um so uh so basically the way that i was doing that before is we we had a pen and paper notebook and it was a little bit of a pain in the butt and once uh Thanks to Bitcoin Shirt Co. If you guys need any stuff that you can't buy from Rollo, which you should buy from Rollo, um, mugs and hats and stuff like that. Um, Rollo has an awesome mug that says, uh, what is it? Uh, Teachers have below average IQ, which is a uh, J.W. Weatherman quote. So, yeah. uh, But uh, he set me up with a uh, lightning node. And now it's like, he I think they do it for free. It's like three clicks. It wasn't automated a few weeks ago. That's what's so awesome about the pace of this stuff was like, I had to pay a couple hundred bucks to have somebody set this stuff up for me. And now it's, uh, yeah, libertymugs.com. Good, good shout out, man. <laughs> um, but, uh, but now, you know, basically a couple clicks, you can have a full node. Um, you can have, uh, um, BTC pay server thrown over the top of it. That's lightning, uh, enabled. And then you can have your zap lightning wallet on your iPhone. Uh, it, it was a pain in the butt for me because I use an iPhone and 
there weren't any wallets out yet. Um, I think there is one on Android, maybe async. Anyway, um, it's all getting better, like by the day. So probably, you know, it's, I'm, I'm probably two weeks behind, but bottom line is I, I was able to set him up with a lightning wallet and I have a lightning wallet and we just pretend that it, 10 Satoshis equals a dollar. And, uh, when I owe him five bucks, I send him 50 Satoshis. And when he owes me, you know, five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever. If he, if he needed to pay me 10 bucks, he'd send me a hundred Satoshis. So it's basically just a, uh, uh, an accounting hack. Um, but yeah, man, I think that there's, I think that is a pretty, um, a pretty common problem, uh, in a bunch of different situations. So like, I think that if there was a really simple, uh, lightning wallet that was like totally scaled down and maybe just hacked the UI, right? Like I would rather it say, if it was like configurable, um, I would rather be able to just send him five bucks and it sends him 50 Satoshis. And so it's completely hidden in the background as far as I'm concerned. I think that would be uh, pretty useful, at least for my weird little use case, right? Where I like, I have to keep track of how much my kid owes me and how much I owe my kid. Um, but uh, but I got to think there's probably a lot of other little weird applications. Like, I mean, maybe even that's not that weird of an application. I guess everybody that has kids, is probably their kid's bank account. Um, so may, maybe, uh, I don't know, that's an idea for somebody, if, if not you, uh, just to take one of the open source lightning wallets and just throw that skin on top of it and make it, make it I don't know, like make it a piggy bank instead, uh, you know, uh, graphic design it, uh, skin it with like a piggy bank and make it cute. But I think there's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of cool things that can happen if people would stop trying to show the next scam. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm glad. Like, whatever abstraction you can just add to that, like Satoshi's to X US dollars or whatever. Yeah, I think that'd be great, you know, be almost instant and to be able to see the status anywhere, like you said, on your phone or if you could even view it too. So, or I think so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. A really cool, you know, uh, use case. Yep. Awesome. Uh, Rolo's got a, a new mug that he just threw in the chat. I do have to share this just cause it's so funny. Uh, let's see if I can, there we go. <laughs> it says public school teachers are overpaid. <laughs> it's awesome. All right. uh, I, I love to go and go on Twitter where, you know, you got all the people that are Ooh, teachers are so great and just post that there and, <laughs> I like the uh, Norm Macdonald that uh, that post with the, the making fun of the teachers. It was, it was great. They're heroes or something. So totally, totally. Yeah, I think Nate dug yeah. that up uh, when Norm Macdonald still had his uh, man parts before he had to hand them over at the View. <laughs> yeah, it was this great thing where he's like uh, talking about how teachers are the real heroes. And uh, there's actually a teacher that's that's uh, hassling him um, while he's doing his act. And uh, he's like, well, you know, it, it seems like you're upset. Like, did you think that you were the real hero? Like, did you? <laughs> that kind of disqualifies you because the real heroes never think they're the heroes. That's uh, great. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to hijack or anything, but I have to. Uh, that reminds me. I did a while ago. I kind of did a Hillary Clinton came to Philly uh, a few years ago and did some talking event and i just kind of did a man on the street interview afterwards asking about why people support hillary clinton and <laughs> got like oh she's great but uh i ended up just letting it go the recording go with some public school teachers and oh my goodness it's insane i'll i'll find i'll dig it up and post it on twitter or something. yeah yeah you, you should load yeah, you know what? You got to play that. I don't. I, I can only imagine what it is because all the public school teachers that I know that are smart have stopped and moved on to something when they realized that it was uh, it was just a, a cesspool. Um, so I can only imagine the people that are sticking around. Um, but yeah, you should you should do that video and then at the end uh, sell your mug. Rollo, is that on your uh, YouTube channel? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll dig it up and post it in the chat right now. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right, let's see. Back to uh, back to work. Dan, what do you got, man? Or actually, did I? I didn't skip anybody, did I? No. All right, Dan. Uh, yeah. So one of one of the favorite lessons that I learned in a 
optim optimization math class I took a while ago was the concept that all, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. Um, I think that's especially a applicable to the economic wor world of economics and the different schools of thought. Um, can you even try to imagine a world in which, and I think the Austrian model is, is right on the money, right? Like it, it makes sense in like regular language. You don't have to create this whole new like uh, dialect and, and language to describe what's going on. But can you imagine a world in which the Austrian model does not uh, work out as, as the most accurate model? Uh, well, I mean, yes, uh, because the Austrian model has had errors in it. Like people have had ideas that have been corrected, right? Um, that people that were in sort of the Austrian school, I think Hayek is a good example of somebody that if you consider him part of like the Austrian canon, uh, then you're going to end up making some serious errors, even like some very basic serious errors around subjective value. But what the Austrian school represents at sort of a higher level is um is a way is, is a uh is something called praxeology and what that means is it's the study of human action and it's using human it's a, a specific way to study human action so praxeology is a um, a larger field that would include things like, um, well, it would include human action that doesn't have to do with money. And we usually just talk about economics in regard to, to uh, monetary stuff. Um, but the idea, the, the sort of the base idea here that splits Austrian economics or praxeology from everything else is the, um, is the way that they go about studying and observing economic truth, like finding economic truth, right? Um, so the praxeological method says, look, it's not possible to do an empirical double blind study on any economic topic. Um, we can't like simulate uh, millions of people and figure out what they're gonna do because there's too many variables and factors involved. And we would only be able to conclude something is true if we controlled for all of the variables um, the same way that we do in like drug studies, right? Like if, if there's five or six different major things that are in flux and somebody gets better, um, then we don't know if it was, they got better from the drug or if it's because they exercised more or whatever. So we, we have big groups and we have to try to factor that out. It's utterly impossible to do that with any economic topic. And uh, the people that say that it's not, look at the conclusions that they come to. The conclusion is always, you should be more of my slave. Um, and I, and that's, that's not a coincidence. It's because these ideas are so stupid that you could only have them if you actually were a liar and you were trying to take over somebody's life um, and, and, you know, get paid from the government um, because they're always, they're always willing to write big checks to intellectuals that will justify their, their misdeeds. Right. Um, so the court historian uh, sort of stuff. Um, so there, there have been, and there, there's even like currently there's a lot of, um, debate over whether fractional reserve banking would exist in a free market or whether it has to be completely supported within the Austrian school. Um, so it's not like there's not conflicts and there's not different ideas, but the basic idea is the way that we figure things out is with logic and reason because we can't do empirical studies. And even if we could do empirical studies, they wouldn't tell us anything in, in the same way that two plus two equals four. Like if we could do a double blind study to figure out if two plus two equals four, we wouldn't get anywhere because the truth of what's going on there is based on the definition of two and plus and four. And uh, the same, the same thing applies to, um, something like a price going up, right? If we want to know why the price went up, um, we'll never really know because there's too many factors involved. But what we can say is that all things being equal, if the supply is decreased, the price will go up, right? And so it's a much more humble um, but accurate way to approach economics. And it stops much sooner, right? It, it, won't, it won't even say why a price went up. It will just say, these are some reasons that the price would go up if everything else was fixed. Um, and then, 
and that it leaves a lot of room for entrepreneurs to uh, just have to take risk, right? And guess as to why something happened and why something is going to happen in the future. So, so I guess to answer your question, yes, the Austrian school has been wrong at times, especially um, uh, depending on who you include in the Austrian school. But the the method of learning about economics is totally sound. Like I cannot imagine a universe in which two plus two doesn't equal four. And I can't imagine a universe in which the right way to go about learning about how the supply of something is going to affect the price or how the price is going to affect the supply would not be through logic and reason. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, uh, I agree with pretty much all that. Cool, cool. Um, John, what's up, man? Thanks for joining. If uh, if you want, hey, you, what's uh, going on? Yeah, you, you, good timing because we just went through uh, we went through everybody. Uh, we're circling cool. back around. So uh, yeah, man, if you got a question, hit me up. I think we're gonna go for about fifteen more minutes, just so you guys know. But then once we turn the live stream off, we're still gonna hang out and chat. Hey, JW, after this, why don't we uh, bang after uh, John goes? Let's uh, bang out the forum questions. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, man. All right, hey, John. Yeah, sorry, I'm late. The meeting ran late, but um, no worries, man. I guess I guess if we had, I honestly have no idea what you guys covered. It sounded like you covered um, Austrian economics, which is pretty awesome. I read Safe Dean's book. I thought it was great. I I'm still like you know way at the top of learning Austrian economics, but um, my question kind of was. How do you go through the thought process or the mental framework, the, the logical framework of understanding, um, you know, the things that you're putting out in your content, like your podcasts? Um, one example that I gave was, you know, what do you think about smart contracts and what could they be applied to, you know, um, knowing that Bitcoin is, you know, sound money, right? Sound money thesis. Um, yeah yeah totally yeah that's right then, i remember that yeah yeah and and you know how how they're gonna work and what the you know what the world is gonna um use them for yep totally yeah so uh so nick and i were talking about like his question is basically like how do i go about analyzing stuff and uh we thought it might be fun to try to talk about this with with some other folks so so, and it fits pretty well into the last question. Um, I think, I think that, so I did a video talking about how logic and reason is our, our best way to learn something. Um, it's better than history or psych psychology or any of that stuff, psychoanalysis, uh, whatever. Um, and, uh, and so it is kind of, uh, I don't know. It, John's question made me think about the fact that I have developed a very systematic and like rigorous approach to software security problems. Uh, like the way that I do threat modeling, it has a long history and uh, I've been doing it for a long time. And so I've kind of refined it the way that I like to do it to avoid details and, you know, whatever. Um, but for something like smart contracts, his, his point was I, I tend to do that in a lot of stuff, right? In a lot of the videos that I'm putting out, I'm just taking a topic and trying to kind of dissect it and, uh, and explore it with logic and reason. So yeah, let's, let's try to do it with, with smart contracts and what the purposes of those guys are. And so if somebody hits me with that, the first thing I try to do is just think about it breaking it like, the, the, the first phase, I think, in thinking about anything is trying to break it down into its simplest parts and then really be 100% clear on what's going on there. Because we, um, we tend to think about stuff really sloppy and high level, um, unless we're disciplined and force ourselves to do it. So if I was to do that with smart contracts, the first thing I would try to do is like, what the heck is a smart contract? Like at the end of the day, what are we really talking about? Um, uh, are we talking about like fairies or what? And the answer is we're talking about software code. Um, so if it's just software code, what makes it special? Um, and the answer for smart contracts is that in theory, it's software code that can't be stopped. Um, and so we can use that to make deals with each other, um, to, to set up arrangements between humans that we can trust are going to execute. So, um, 
for example, and I don't think we can do this really yet, and maybe we won't be able to, but let's say it's a, just a simple bet. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to like analyze this and also think about my process. So first I break it down as mu in as much detail as I can to get to the, like just scrape all the, the pounds of crap away, right? Like when you start talking about smart contracts, like we're all, we've all been in, inundated with so much nonsense. Like if we start talking about democracy, we have to like overcome so much propaganda and programming that's like floating around in our head and just try to cut it back to what exactly the hell we're talking about. Um, I think it's the same way if you've been on, had any interest in Bitcoin, like there's so many, so much smart contract garbage that's been thrown around. Um, so break it down to its smallest part. Um, think about exactly what it is, like take all the propaganda off. Um, and then uh, I guess now I'm sort of in the phase where I'm, I'm building back up a little bit. So I'm trying to think of applications, right? So I want to think of like the very simplest application because that'll help me think about the abstract con concept. So the simplest application I think would be uh, a bet. So we bet whether the Knicks are going to lose on Sunday or not or Friday or whatever, whatever the big basketball games are. Um, Tuesday, I don't know, is that football, whatever. Um, so we're, we're going to bet on whether the Knicks win on this particular night. And, uh, and so we put our money into the pot. And what a smart contract could do is it could take the money. And in theory, if it could know whether the Knicks won or not, um, then it could give that money to me or it could, all the money to me or it could give all the money to you. Um, and that sounds useful, right? Because there's a lot of applications like that or, you know, selling a car, basically buying anything online, right? You could, uh, it's kind of a, a bet, like, are you actually going to ship it to me? Um, and betting whether the other person is actually going to pay. Um, and then the third party, uh, you know, you can have a third party ar arbitrage the thing. And so we actually do have smart contracts on Bitcoin. Lightning Network is all smart contract stuff. Um, but uh, but all of the hype stuff hasn't really arrived yet. And I think most of the hype stuff probably won't, right? Like that's just kind of a general good, um, I don't know, rule of thumb. Like, you know, most of the stuff that people say is never going to happen. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess it would be interesting to to try to formalize that process a little bit more. And I, I kind of did think of a few tricks that I use, but I bet there's just a ton of different tricks that I use to jump around. The The main thing I would say is it's just, it just gets easier with practice. Um, and I, I think that's why I'm good at it because I've done, I've been paid to do this so many times, like take a really complicated system, break it down in its component parts, figure out what those things do. Um, you know, take the take the white paper and shred all the marketing crap out of it and figure out, okay, this component just takes in these two inputs and gives that output. Great. I wish they could have told me that, you know, instead of uh, all the all the business speak and that sort of stuff. So I think it probably just gets easier with practice. But um, uh, but yeah, I, I, you know what? I bet somebody will hit us up on Twitter with a formal process because there probably is a formal process. Like threat modeling is the formal process to apply sort of logic and reason to security problems, uh, security design problems, let's say. I bet there's a generic one that I just don't know of that we probably all do. Uh, when, when we're doing it good, we probably do it uh, already instinctively. So yeah, interesting topic, man. Uh, but I guess uh, all that's to say, I don't really know, but I wish uh, maybe, maybe somebody, somebody listening will help us out. Can I uh, ask a real quick follow up to that then? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I had noticed that you do and some of the others that I mentioned um, is you just like you create extremes when you're making a logical argument. So yep. if we're if we're talking about in 30 years, um, you know, if Bitcoin's going to be more valuable than it is today, and you just like you break it down into the the first principles, you know, and then you build it back up and you say, all right, Bitcoin's going to be, um, 
more valuable than it is today because we're going to adopt Bitcoin over um, fiat currency. And if we if we if Bitcoin dies, then what does fiat look like kind of a thing? Right. Or yeah, or totally if all of crypto dies. And what does fiat and what does the world look like? So I think yep. um, that's part of it. And I was just wondering if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, actually, when you were saying that, I was thinking about the reduction reductio ad absurdum as a uh, as a you know an argument technique, right? Reduction to absurdity. Um, okay. So if yeah, somebody, that's if somebody, is. yeah, I, I think there's, I think that's part of it is that I developed a habit of doing that to my opponents also. But you know, the best thing that I think to just be able to do this sort of stuff is to read people that are really good at it. And the three three people that I love the most for their ability to take an argument and, or take something that's really complicated and break it down into really simple parts and like prove a point in the process. Uh, Martin Luther is my favorite uh, because he's super entertaining too. So a lot of people are annoyed that I'll be making a logical argument and then I'll say something insulting to the opposition. Like read Martin Luther, man, that guy is brutal. He's, to I mean, he's brilliant and he's really eloquent, but the way that he describes, uh, the way that he insults the opponents is super entertaining. Like I just crack up reading the guy. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's a bad influence, but Martin Luther, John Calvin is another one that, uh, like, he he's he's known for you know these are both theologians right but they're taking really complicated things and uh using everything that they can to try to get to as much truth as possible and the other thing that they're really good at is saying this is where my understanding stops right like i i i believe this to be true and here's all the reasons right like they'll you, you don't even you don't have to be religious at all to be uh to benefit from reading this stuff because they'll take a topic that's super controversial um, that, that literally thousands of people have died over or hundreds or maybe millions. Uh, I was going to say hundred thousands, but, um, and they'll just address it very logically and uh, systematically. And their whole approach is like, look, I don't care whether you agree with me or not. Um, but I'm going to explain my thought process so that if you disagree with me, you know exactly where we diverged, right? So that is, I think, really, really uh, helpful. It's just to read guys that do that. Um, and then, you know, uh, the, the third guy that's like my favorite for that is Ludwig von Mises. Um, he's, uh, you know, obviously the sort of the, uh, the premier guy in the Austrian School of Economics. And his book, Human Action, is ex like... There's no way that you can disagree with anything that the guy says, <laughs> because if you do, you just missed a page. Like you just flip back a couple pages and it's very incremental and systematic and mathematical in that way. Uh, but if he did make an error, then it'll be really easy to find because he's super, super clear thinking and uh, systematic in his explanation. So I guess I'd say that's probably my best recommendation. I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's a formal process. There probably is that could help, but I bet just watching really brilliant people do it um, is probably the best way to learn how to do it. And I'm not uh, like, if, if you think that I'm good at it, like read those guys, it, it takes a little bit of a uh, muscle to, you have like, you probably won't enjoy reading it because it's uh, because these guys are really, really smart. And um, what they say is really, really dense. But once you, it's like, once you learn how to ride that bike, then it's really hard to put them down because everything else just sounds like Charlie Brown's mom uh, after you get into these guys. So, um, cool. All right, I better uh, I better let Nate ask me some of the questions from the forum, and then I think we'll wrap Ra wrap the live part. All right, uh, this is from Ryan Rogus. Um, what are your thoughts about Coinbase having board members who are connected to the Re Federal Reserve? Uh, what What's the interplay if having a few people connected to the major circles of where finance and government overlap? Yeah, that's a cool question. Um, so, so I've heard some of the conspiracy theory stuff that comes out around uh, Bitcoin being controlled by the government or by the Federal Reserve or whatever. And one of the things that it always hinges on is this idea that, you know, there's board members that are part of the Federal Reserve that are part of Coinbase or part of you know, uh, what is this 
the that three letter company CG whatever that invested in Coinbase and also has invested in Blockstream um, or uh, the Blockstream conspiracies of like these guys that invested in Blockstream are, are also part of AIG and those board members are also you know part of I don't know Lockheed Martin or something so okay. there there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that pop up. Um, and uh, and they're they're often gosh dang it can I do this um, they're they're often related to uh, the reality that a lot of people are um, kind of confused about how the world works and one of the things that helps is just knowing that there doesn't have to be a grand conspiracy for all these things to come together um, if you read any books on like networking or building a business you'll realize that. Sorry, I got uh, wrong person selected there. You'll realize that not only are not only is it smart to build like large professional networks of people that can help you out and that you have a history of helping out, but anybody that has parents that have wanted them to be successful and they've been successful have taught their kids to develop this skill. And one of the natural consequences of that is that uh, people that are successful and powerful are social and they they work together on a lot of stuff and one of the ways that this is super obvious is if you just look at the list of people that are on the board of directors for any major charity or any big business um, it's not an accident like that they're very much they represent a network right uh, because if you are if you're a board member let's say you're a board member for Toy Toyota and um, you uh you want your business to do well and there's a board opening where are you going to go to get the board member are you going to go to like the local mcdonald's no you're going to go to another company that is really successful in, in your professional network and find other people that have been successful board members because it is a skill set also being a, a member of a board it's like it's you have like little sprints where you have to put in a lot of freaking work i i really don't like it but um so you go like it's not like working as a, a VP of a company because then you're always in it board members are like they're not in it they're working on other things and they have to pop in and make like super critical decisions and so they have to just intensely research something for you know a week before the next board meeting or something um, so uh, so what that means is that you would probably reach out and you would want to find somebody that is a board member somewhere else has a good history of being a good board member um, and also you'd want to be strategic about it so if you're toyota you might try to get somebody that is a board member of at, at nissan but maybe there's a conflict of interest so that might be a little awkward but you probably there's a lot of reasons you would still want to do it uh, but maybe you end up getting a board member from lockheed martin and part of the reason that you do that is that you're Toyota and you get kicked around by the federal government and it's good to have a friend that's part of a company that never gets kicked around by the federal government, right? So the end result of that is that uh, if you just look at the list, everybody is board members with everybody else, right? It's, and it's just the way that, uh, it's just the way that it works. So it's not shocking at all to me that somebody that's part of the Federal Reserve is at Coinbase. Um, I think the reason that it's really disturbs people is they have this weird idea of, um, uh, sort of things being like way more official or may, way less able to be corrupted maybe than they think like, oh my gosh, how could, how could somebody be, you know, a public servant, but have a relationship that's that close with somebody that they're regulating? Like, yeah, dude, that's how this works. Like. The, you know, people don't become non-human anymore uh, when you give them a bunch of power. Uh, they and they don't actually have very much power unless they maintain a bunch of outside relationships. Also, so um, yeah, it, uh, there's there's a good book that I've recommended before called Never Eat Alone, and uh, I think there, there's a lot of gross stuff in it, right? Like it talks about Bill Clinton and how he became successful, and you know, we know Bill Clinton is one of the greasiest people that's ever lived, but uh, but it gives you a much better idea of how to be successful yourself and why it's really silly to think that like you should trust a government servant uh, because they're not government servants. They're, they're still people trying to build their network and become successful. So um, 
let's see. Uh, good question, though. Uh, what's I, I think let's do one more question from the forum, and then then we'll bag it and just hang out. Oh, wait a minute. Actually, I'm sorry. Sean's here. We'll we'll do a question from Sean. Let's do that, and then we'll go back to the forum. Hey, man. Yep. Thanks for thanks for jumping on. Hey, what's up? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You sound good. All right, cool. Um, I don't know if I have any questions. I just kind of jumped in late, so I don't know what you guys are talking about. I was going to just put a question in the forum, but I kind of wanted to just get your take on an idea I, was, I, I heard. Yeah, man. Um, and it's kind of something similar to I think I've, I've heard you speak about on a different topic, but in terms of alts, um, I was wondering what you thought of them being net good for the overall survival of Bitcoin because they offer a larger attack vector for the, like the state or larger institutions. It would be super expensive to try to stop Bitcoin at this point. And even if it's successful, they'd have a thousand more projects to go through. Um, even though they're basically <clears throat> mostly silly and almost mostly worthless, are they net good overall? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I've disagreed with some really smart people that, uh, that think that it is. Like I, I know there's some people that they'll even support altcoins. Like they'll, they'll uh, write a little bit of code um, or do something that gives them a little bit of a boost, even though they absolutely despise those coins and the whole system because they, they have this, this perspective. Um, and this is, you know, this is tough, like entrepreneurial sort of guesswork, right? But they have this perspective that if there is, um, if this coin exists, then it provides cover for Bitcoin. Like if, if corrupt governments start going after a coin, they're going to go after this one first because um, of whatever reason. Uh, and so we'll keep that one out there as sort of, uh, you know, like a sacrificial lamb as, you know, covering, covering fire sort of thing. Um, my, my guess, right? Like my personal take on it is I don't agree with that because one, I think if the governments of the world, you know, we're going to put a lot of work into trying to shut down cryptocurrencies, they would realize instantly that there's only one that they can't shut down. Like, how long would it take you to figure out that you could shut down Ethereum just by grabbing that scrawny, skinny little neck of uh, Vitalik um, or just letting him know that you're going to, right? Like, that, that guy is ready to roll over on his back and show you his throat as soon as you make a phone call. Um, and the same thing with like uh, Monero, right? Like you think Fluffy Pony is is going to, you know, become an enemy of the state uh, for his scam? No, he's like, you just make a phone call and instantly that guy is like, what can I do for you, sir? You know? Um, so I think they would figure that out real fast. And, uh, and because of that, I think that it only has negative side effects. And that is that uh, it slows people down from knowing where to invest. Like people want to opt out of fiat, um, they, they think that maybe gold is a good idea. They're not quite sure. And they, they hear about this digital currency stuff. If it was really obvious to those people that Bitcoin is the only legitimate digital currency, I think we would see adoption happening much more rapidly. So, uh, but it's a tough call because, you know, the other argument on their side is that people won't even hear about Bitcoin if there's not the hype over Ethereum and the excitement over Ripple and all that other stuff. You know, these marketing machines are pouring out tons of money to get people excited and hyped up. And then once they realize that Ripple and Ethereum is garbage, they'll eventually, you know, they're they're much more exposed to the concept and they might buy Bitcoin. So I don't know. I mean, it, it really just comes down to a guess, but my guess is that it slows things down, but I absolutely could be wrong. Cool. Good answer. Cool. What was that last question there, Nate? Uh, what's your opinion on identity on the blockchain, mainly the projects Civic and Sorvin? Do they make sense? Can they capture value for speculators? So I, I, I it's, isn't Civic run by that Vinny Langham guy? Um, if it is, then, you know, he's a scammer. It's a scam. I don't even have to look into it. I know it's been around for a long time. Like, I feel like I've heard of it for quite a while, Civic. I don't recognize the other one. But um, but what I would say is I don't know what problem they're trying to solve. Um, and it doesn't here, – here's a good general rule of thumb. If it doesn't need to be government hard, then it can be in a database. Um, so if we wanted to build like, uh, um, I don't know, like garbage pail, digital garbage pail kids, right? Uh, we could just put those in a database, just like crypto kitties. We don't need to put, we don't need a blockchain for that. Um, 
it's, it'd be really inefficient. So we just put it in a database because it's not illegal, right? Like there's the government's not going to come shut us down because we're trying to create digital garbage pail kids, right? Um, so there's a lot of projects that fall in that category. Um, and you can still do stuff like digital time stamping and all kinds of other things to you know provide the level of security that you think you might need with garbage pail kits or something more serious like stocks uh um you know like who who owns a given stock uh would would be one way um would be another application that would be more security sensitive but you still probably could just do it in a database um but uh on the other hand uh you have things that need to be government hard right that that cannot be shut down, that can't be reversed, that can't be prevented from doing something, even if a very powerful government wanted to do it. And those are things like, um, you know, you could maybe say stock ownership falls into that category, right? Uh, where you, you really want it to be government resistant for whatever reason, even though there's legal enforcement ultimately with those things because they're custodial, you could still say there's some benefit maybe for governments not to be able to overwrite that. or. Uh, land deeds is another one, right? Like, yes, the government does have to enforce a land deed, but the whole world being able to see that, you know, Bob Jones actually owns that piece of land um, and that the government can't reverse that, they can't cover it up or hide it, that the title is actually for that person, there is some value there. Um, yeah, Vinny is the co-founder and CEO of Civic. Yeah, so it's definitely a scam because uh, he is definitely a scamming, uh, lying piece of garbage um but uh let's see what was i gonna say okay so in those cases when it needs to be government hard uh then it has to go on bitcoin because there isn't there is no other government hard blockchain around um and uh you know there's no question that governments could shut down ethereum like ethereum has come out and said we want to be we want to make the trade-off to be more government friendly or some nonsense like that right um, so they don't even want to try to pretend that they could be resistant to corrupt government. Um, so yeah, your choices are either database or Bitcoin. Now that could change in the future, right? Like I'm not opposed to the idea that somebody could build something better than Bitcoin, but um, but it just hasn't happened and there hasn't even been any hints of it. And every smart person that's had any interest in building something real has said, why would I rebuild when I can just contribute to this great open source project with a lot of other smart people and a great history and uh, you know a lot of people that are already very invested so it's much closer to being adopted as money um so i expect that to be the trend that continues but um and then i guess the, the only other thing i want to say is that identity is a really disturbing topic uh identity usually doesn't mean reputation um, the only thing that you need and that I need is a reputation. And those reputations could be in the form of a small business name that's fungible, right? Like I can create a reputation called Wendy's and I can sell a bunch of really good hamburgers for a really long time and I can sell that name. I can sell that reputation to somebody else. Um, that's that sort of stuff that we, we need. Uh, what we don't need is asset tags. We don't need human asset tags. We don't need government issued names that are associated with our physical person uh, because that makes us very vulnerable. And the reason that it makes us vulnerable is that we are inventoried and cataloged like cattle. And if you don't want to be treated like cattle, then you really don't want to be cataloged like cattle. Um, the Social security card almost created a revolt in the United States when they tried to roll it out for that reason. People understood uh, back then that if you if you have a government issued ID number, that is a step towards totalitarianism and uh, it just gives the, it gives the government too much power over you and it's not necessary. So uh, in general, that form of identity is a really, really bad idea. Uh, Cool. All right. Well, I wanted to wrap this up at about uh, after 45 minutes, we went a little bit longer, but this is awesome, man. I appreciate all of you guys taking the class and showing up with your questions. Um, I think uh, for the people that are that are going to watch this later, I think we got to cover some interesting topics. And uh, let's see, I guess I should give a plug for the class. If you guys are interested in signing up, go to jwweatherman.com forward slash class, and then you can just hit the register button and create an account. Um, and we'll get back to you on um, how to pay and all that good stuff. Uh, but the class is, uh, it's a really good class. I'm not just saying that. I've, the, the, 
the quality of conversations that I get to have with people that have taken the class are exactly what I was hoping for. It's people that are significantly leveled up on their economics understanding and their understanding of open source and uh, technology in general. Um, so check it out. And uh, if you guys have any questions, you can also hit me up at jwweatherman underscore on Twitter um, or jwweatherman.com. But to get to information about the class, go to jwweatherman.com forward slash class, C-L-A-S-S. -S. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. And we will catch you all next time. Everybody that's on, don't hang up because we're going to still hang out and chat.